grateful. Please stand with me as we continue to three for of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with a horrible heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and heal us, so that we may be the light of your will and the law of your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in His mercy has given His only Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll continue now with our open hymn.
the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. church of God and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. And defend this gracious Lord. This is the peace, the victory for our God. Alleluia. Thank you. 
all responsibly. Answer me when I call, O oh God, the tender of my cause. You set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I call. Offer me appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, the Lord, may be rest secure. The second reading is from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For a ghost does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. But just prior to this text this morning, in Luke's Gospel, is the account of the walk to Emmaus. It's one of my favorite Easter stories. And to set the context for today's text, I'd like to share a little bit about the walk to Emmaus with you. On Sunday, the day Jesus rose from the dead, two of his disciples were walking the seven miles between Jerusalem and the little town village of Emmaus. It appeared that they were going home. It had all looked so promising. They really did believe Jesus was the Messiah. And then their hopes crumbled as Jesus was crucified by the Roman government. Now, it's the third day since Jesus' death. The day, according to Jewish tradition, the spirit of a person leaves their dead body. They learned just this morning, not only did Jesus' spirit vacate the temple, but his body is also missing. Needless to say, they are confused. Still feeling the sting of death. 
still grieving the loss of their friend and rabbi, still trying to make sense out of all. And rehearsing the details over and over and over again as they walk. Into their confusion, Jesus comes up from behind them and kind of joins along with them. But because of their disillusionment and greed, they failed to recognize Jesus. They weren't expecting to see Him. The last person they ever thought they'd ever see again was Jesus in the flesh. How often I have failed to see the obvious because of some particular mental state I have to be in at that moment, focusing all of my mental energy on a particular problem and missing the wider picture. We call that tunnel vision, where things just keep shrinking down and down and down and down and down so you can only see the, the pinpoint that you're focusing on and everything else is out of your view. It's there, but you don't even recognize it. it, it it's there. It's an amazing thought for me that Jesus would take the time to enter into the confusion of two of his disciples. And these are not one of the eleven. They're disciples that have followed Jesus, but they're not the primary disciples. They're not the apostles. But Jesus took time to enter into their conversation, to enter into their confusion, continuing then to teach them, even as they now refer to him as a prophet and no longer as a Messiah, as Messiah. As they continue their journey together, Jesus begins to open up the scriptures for them and to interpret the passage, passages, pass, passage after passage after passage, to show them how it was necessary for them, that the Messiah should suffer and die by crucifixion and on the third day rise. Jesus is the lens through which the rest of the scripture becomes focused and clarified. In fact, the two disciples begin to see that all Scripture points to Jesus. Jesus is the key fulfilling all the Messianic prophecies. When they reach Emmaus, Jesus acts like He's going to go on. Now this is late, late in the afternoon. And Aaron was not safe to travel alone on the roads because there were robbers out there in different places. And so they begin to constrain Him to stay with them. And He consents. At dinner, however, Jesus, who is the guest, takes over and acts like he's the host. He took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and made their way the seven miles back to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were saying these things, Jesus appeared and stood in their midst of them and said, Peace be with you. But they were terrified, thinking he was a ghost. Jesus asked them why they were troubled. He showed them his hands and feet as proof that it was indeed himself. Jesus was crucified, and his wounds were the wounds of crucifixion. Jesus invited them to handle him and see, reminding them that a spirit of ghost does not have flesh and bone as he has. For he is the resurrected, resurrected and still incarnate Son of God, the first to have a resurrected body. But still the disciples couldn't believe their eyes. It was like they were saying, this cannot be. It's impossible that Jesus is indeed risen from the dead. And they marvel. Jesus asked them, do you have any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, I think this is meant to be a little humor here, biblical humor, but we just glaze over it like, oh, that's all that's very there. He ate right from them. <laughs> what were they expecting? That the food would fall out? A ghost can't take in food and keep it in. They're looking to see if it stayed in. Or does it fall in? It's a fish on the floor now. <laughs> Gosh. These are my words, Jesus, wanted to remind them, which I spoke to you while I was still with you. 
But all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, just like he did to the two disciples who were walking to Emmaus. Thus it is written that the Messiah should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Well, it's a great story and true. But what does it mean for us? Well, first, Luke didn't write this whole story down for the sake of the, the apostles and, and the disciples. They were there. They witnessed it. They had a part in it. They saw and heard the Word of God who was alive. Luke wrote this down for the sake of generations to come. People like you and me. And others will come after us. That many might come to faith in Jesus through the proclamation of the Gospel, leading to repentance and forgiveness of sins. For that is why Jesus came into the world, so that all who believe in Him might be saved, forgiven, justified, and redeemed. You know, we went through, I don't know how many of you were at Sunday school, or I know our little, you know, clutch over of a few in Bible study on Thursday morning. We even spent a whole year on Christian apologetics. And oftentimes we, we would talk about that in our faith, it's not a blind faith. Our faith is an evidence-based faith. Now, most everybody that goes to school, they're going to learn, you know, they're going to learn evolutionary, evolutionary theory, which is taught not as a theory, by the way, it's taught as fact, right? They teach it as fact, which is a bunch of nonsense if you actually ever discover and look at what they're talking about. I mean, my brother took... Um, Climbing Mount Probable. You know, that was Dawkins' book, the whole book. And he read it, and he started then underlining all the places where it said, well, it could have happened this way. It might be this. It could have happened. Maybe. We, you know, all these kind of things. And he, he, he just underlined it. And pretty soon he said, I didn't have a book anymore. I had a pamphlet. There was no proof whatsoever. It was all on supposition, built on another person's supposition, built on another supposition, built on another supposition, but there was no truth there. It was all philosophy. It was all religion. Here's the deal. You want to quick, quick, if you want to prove this to yourself, is anybody good at math? I'm not. Figure out, math-wise, if you took 150 amino acids, which would be a nice medium-sized um, protein of 150, and let's forget that amino acids don't like getting together. They like to get together in your cells, but they won't get together in nature. They can't hardly, they can't hardly do it. They thought they'd get together in water, but they don't. And you'd Yahtzee them out there. What would that number be if you could Yahtzee 1 to 150 out all at one time, on one roll? What would that take? I don't know either. They say there's 10 to the 80 particles in the known universe. This number is in the 200, 10 to the 200 and some. Right? That's never happened. The problem is, however old they think the universe is, our planet is, our solar system is, there's not been enough time for one protein to form all by chance. And you know, evolution can't start until you have a living something, right? You can't start. You can't mutate something that doesn't exist. Here's, here's the example that Stephen Meyer gives. He said, our whole galaxy is a big bath of a big swimming pool. There's a ladder here, a ladder on the other side. You, dump a, you throw a blind man out there and you tell him your job is to swim the other side of the galaxy and find a ladder and get out. That's what that number represents. And let's say, let's say you had millions, this is by chance. I mean, you're never going to get one, but let's say you had a million uh, uh, protein laying on the ground. What are they good for? What do you do with them? Who's going to do anything with them? They're just proteins. They're building blocks. They're like, you threw blocks, bricks down on the ground. Well, so you got bricks on the ground. What are you doing with it? Is there information? It's like, you know, a big whirlwind went through the junkyard and out pops a 747. Is that happening? It ain't happening. It takes intelligence to create anything. You can't create, you know, you have three billion bits of, of information in you. It's like a code. 
And it has to be perfectly written and perfectly executed for what happens. You have a miscarriage if there's a little problem. If there's a little snafu in there, then you know your body takes care of it, you have a miscarriage. It wasn't right. Something didn't happen, it didn't unfold right. What I'm saying to you is those people who believe in evolution are the people who have faith, blind faith, because they have nothing dependent on. It is a philosophy, it is a religion, and it's based on atheism. Because they do not want there to be a God, because if there is a God, then you are responsible to that God, and that's the one thing they will not tolerate. And we just soak it up and believe it. You wonder why your kids aren't here? Because they believe that crap. And what have you done to disabuse them of it? Nothing. Oh, the teacher's talking about it. Well, the teacher's kept to talk a lot of stuff that's worthless. That's worthless. We have an evidence-based faith. Paul said, look, you know, he gave the whole chronology. At first, Jesus showed himself to the women. Then he showed himself to the apostles. Then he showed himself to James, the half-brother of Jesus, and his half-brother. And other members of his own family. And he said, last of all, he showed himself to me in Revelation. And then he showed, before he ascended, he, he showed himself to 500 of the brethren. At one time, he said, most of those people were still alive. Of, of that, a few have fallen asleep. They died. What's he saying that about? He's saying, if you don't believe me, go find those people. They're still alive. They're there. They can tell you. And not only that, Tacitus and other, um, you know, historians, Roman historians, they talked about Jesus. They talked about him being crucified. So he was a real person who really lived. And there was all sorts of people who could testify that he rose from the dead. We have evidence. So our faith is founded on evidence. We don't have one faith. That's why Peter said, be ready to give anybody who asks you a reasonable explanation of the hope that dwells within you. Because you have evidence. And we are able then to talk about that in a cogent, loving, caring way, hopefully, to people, our own children, grandchildren. That's why that's important to learn how to do it. Look, you can't impart what you don't have. You can't give away what you don't possess. So if you don't have it, you're not giving it to anybody. Your children or anybody else. You're trusting somebody else that they'll teach them the right things and maybe things will turn out okay. That's blind faith. I don't like the odds. Second, Luke reminds us that those who became followers of Jesus, that the gospel was first presented to the Jewish people as the proclamation was to begin in Jerusalem and then be expanded outward to the nations, to all the Gentile world. And during his ministry, Jesus prophesied his return to Jerusalem at the consummation of human history. So what began in Jerusalem will come full circle and end in Jerusalem. For it is the city of David and the city of God. Then Jesus speaks to us. As Jesus commissioned the disciples, so he also commissions us. You too are called to proclaim the law and gospel in Jesus' name. So the repentance and forgiveness of sins may be available to all who have ears to hear it. In order to accomplish the mission, there has to be a sense of urgency. Jesus has ascended to the Father. We're not left alone. His Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within each of us and witnesses to our spirit that we belong to God. Jesus gave the disciples 30,000 feet kind of view of the mission. He told them where to begin, where to go, and what message to bring to the people. His message has become our message. And though he's not given us the strategy on how to carry that in every place and every time, he's given us what we're to do. And it is urgent because faith in Jesus or lack thereof has eternal consequences. For as Jesus said, no one can come to the Father but by me. Jesus said also, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. It has been said, as I said before, Howard Hendricks said it, He's passed away with the Lord. He used to be a professor at, um, I think it's uh, the, the Southern Baptist uh, Seminary in Texas. And he's the one who said, you cannot impart what you do not possess. And I believe it's a true statement. 
If you don't have something, you can't give it away to another person. However, when dealing with God, the Holy Spirit, you know, we might begin to ask, who possesses whom? Who possesses whom? Is it I who possess the Holy Spirit? Or does the Holy Spirit, Spirit take possession of me by dwelling within me? Oh yes, I believe that we have to invite the Holy Spirit in. Because the Holy Spirit, like God, is a gentleman. He's not, well, okay, like he does it sometimes. He got he threw Paul down off the off a donkey he was riding, or mule, and he threw him on the ground. And he put his foot on his neck and said, hey, don't you find this interesting? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He says, why are you persecuting me? Right? So, okay, granted, God will do that sometimes. Jesus may do that sometimes. But normally, the Holy Spirit won't come in unless you invite Him. You've got to open the door. And Jesus talked about that too. We've got to open the door and invite Him in. We welcome Him. And He comes in and dwells within us. But make no mistake, when you invite Him in, what you're inviting Him in to do is to kill you and make you alive again. It's about a death and a resurrection. And that the Father's will be accomplished in me. Therefore, I do not belong to myself anymore. Paul talks about that. For I acknowledge God's right as Creator. And the price our Father pay, has paid in the sacrifice of His Son as a ransom for my life and for many. In addition, the Holy Spirit fashions us into living stones. We remember as Jesus rode the donkey down the Mount of Olives, some Pharisees told Jesus to silence the crowd. But Jesus told them, if these do not cry out, then the stones on the ground will cry out. We, beloved, are now those living stones who are to cry out. Because God has made us, the Holy Spirit makes us into living stones. And we're no longer to have a secular worldview. We're to see the world through God's eyes, through His Word, and the event of redemption God has wrought through Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. As the Scripture says, you no longer belong to yourself, for you have been bought with a price. While we accomplish our mission with urgency, we also accomplish it filled with God's peace. What is God's peace? That peace that passes all human understanding, we pray that it keeps our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That peace is the word of the gospel that the warfare between God the Father, who God has waged, and we have waged against God in treasonous action and rebellion, that war is ended in the blood of Jesus Christ. We have peace with God our Father. And because of that peace with each other. One of the last things Jesus does in Mark and in Luke's Gospel is He breathes on the disciples and on numerous occasions fills them with the Holy Spirit. And then Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in them for the rest of their lives. That peace is to well up within us, to make a living spring of water within us unto our eternal life.
who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.